The following is a video presentation of a lecture delivered by Dr. Mark Chrislip on September 19, 2010 at Portland State University in regards to vaccines and the myths and fallacies surrounding them. This is brought to you by Oregonians for Science and Reason in conjunction with Portland State University. You can visit us at www.o4sr.org. Because after I'm 32 years out of college and I still have nightmare taking tests, nightmares about taking tests, just walking in this room gives me a cold sweat, but I'm not prepared for the multiple choice test, but I don't have an energy pencil. So we're in trouble. So I'll, um, you always start off when you give infectious disease talks or the talks of conflicts of interest, and I don't have any. I haven't talked to a drug rep for 25 years. Um, this is the only thing I've ever taken from a drug rep. You can't quite see it. It's a fleet cinema that the Unison rep sent me because he didn't like what I was saying about him. It's still unused, I want to emphasize, in sitting on the, uh, <laughs> sitting on the uh, shelves in my office. And I proudly show it to all of them come in. So what I'm going to do is go through sort of the general arguments that you hear. And if you go, this is a hard talk to give in 50 minutes. Do you go broad or do you go narrow and deep? And I'm going to try and go broad, just touch on a bunch of topics rapidly about things that you hear um, about um, why you shouldn't trust vaccines, vaccine makers, and the data behind vaccines. And the first and uh, what you always get is that we're nothing but shills for the medical industrial complex. Um, and I'm not. And most of the people I know are not. But one of the arguments you hear is about all these drugs, all these, all these vaccines, the studies are sponsored by Big Pharma. Um, they get paid to do them. Of course, they're going to have benefit and show good efficacy because they make a lot of money doing it. Now, it is true that funding source does determine the buy or the outcomes and studies, and that is something you have to factor into it whenever you read a series of clinical trials. And you have to figure that you got to look at the funding. If it's all pharmaceutical company funded, it's probably going to be biased a little bit in favor. The person who pays the bills always gets their results. But it's a subtle bias, not an all or nothing uh, phenomenon to invalidate the results. So someone says you can't trust it because it was sponsored by the pharmaceutical company. One, who else is going to pay for it? But two, the bias is there, but it's often a subtle bias. And you have to look at the quality of the study, not just the funding as to who, um, who did it. And you can see from this particular one from JAMA, which is always my favorite, um, is that basically, um, if it was funded by for-profit organizations, it was uh, found favorable 51% of the time. If it was a non-profit, it was only 30% of the time. But that's not a great problem. It's just a minor problem in medicine. But we all have to pay our bills. And so if you go to the two sites that are most out there about, age, uh, about uh, vaccines and autism, one is Generation Rescue. Well, they got their people paying for it. And the other is Age of Autism. That's the ads you find on their website. You can't go to a website without finding Google ads on it. We all have our corporate masters that we bow down to. I bow down to Galaxo. They bow down to Nana's Cookies. And they probably get a better deal out of it because at least they get some cookies. But we're all biased by our finances. So you just have to have that up front and know that when you're going into uh, evaluating studies. And so, you know, the pot calling the kettle black kind of deal, everybody gets money from somebody. And I'm not getting wealthy vaccinating people. Actually, I don't make a dime one when I recommend vaccinations. And in fact, for pediatricians, most, as this study shows, most pediatricians either break even or lose money when they get vaccines. Vaccines is not a profit center for pediatricians. And this was a study that was published in in pediatrics. It basically showed that um, most of them are either break even or suffer financial losses for, for vaccines. So when you when someone's saying vaccines, they're probably not making money from giving them if they're a physician. And um, actually in medicine these days, um, that's a big problem. Let's talk about vaccines. And you know that even though I'm not a corporate shill, I'm biased because somebody's paying my bills. Um, let's talk about vaccines. Um, and for me, vaccines have always been like fresh air and clean water. How can you be against it? It's like being against the flag and, and apple pie and mom. I mean, there's such good benefits. When I was going to medical school and residency, I never thought that anybody could possibly be against vaccines because they, they you know, the, the reason we all live through our 90s is flush toilets, um, good nutrition, and vaccines. That flush toilets, so help. 
knowing the under, understanding how diseases is spread is key for, for uh, breaking transmission of disease. If you know you figure it out by coughing, you can do things that way. If you know to spread by eating uh, contaminated water, you can stop the disease that way. The fact that that, that, and you'll see that people say, well, the rates of diseases were going down before vaccines started, and that's true. But we've wiped them off the face of the earth almost in some places because of vaccines. And it's always a multifactorial intervention that has led to the decrease in all these diseases. And when you read the anti-vaccine side, they're very binary in their approach, a very yes or no, all or nothing. Either vaccines do it all or they don't do anything. And the effects of vaccines are part of multiple things that have been done over time. And for example, like I say here, tuberculosis used to affect a third of Europe. Now you don't see much TB and we don't have a vaccine, but we do, but we don't use it in this country, uh, against tuberculosis, and it still managed to disappear. But the final, you know, the final yards have been taken out uh, by vaccines and what they do. Um, and then there are a bunch of vaccines out there. So the efficacy of a given vaccine is very dependent on what type it is. There's live vaccines, there's killed vaccines, there are protein vaccines, there are carbohydrate vaccines. There's all sorts. Each one has a different efficacy profile, a different toxicity profile. They're not all the same thing. It's like saying cancer is all the same thing. It's many different diseases. There's many different infections. There's many different vaccines. And each one is a different thing um, that the vaccines target. And remember, the goal of vaccines for those is that when you give a vaccine, you give a little bit of the organism so the immune system recognizes it. It develops an antibody against whatever it is. And then when you're exposed at a later date, either you don't get the disease as a rule or you get a lessened disease as a rule. What, and you can see, um, in low-income countries, vaccine and infectious diseases are still predominant. It still amazes me that in the low-income, number three cause of death in children is diarrheal diseases, which kills millions of kids. <laughs> There's several hundred thousand cases of, of um, of um, measles every year in the world, and tuberculosis. And infectious diseases, we don't see them a lot in the West because of both nutrition and, and, and hygiene and vaccines. But remember, the rest of the world is filled with these vaccines, and I'm sorry, <laughs> filled with these infections, and they are just an airplane to fly away from coming to the Pacific Northwest or wherever we live. Now this is, when you give infectious disease talks, you always give, uh, show big tables and small numbers. In the old days, I used to shake them a lot so no one could read it. But this shows basically how infections have varied over the years, both before and after the vaccine. And if you look at the peak and the top row of diphtheria, it caused, um, um, before vaccines, 30,000 cases a year in 1938 and 3,000 deaths. In the vaccine period, diphtheria causes zero cases and zero deaths. That's what vaccines have done. So in 1938, we still we knew how the disease was spread. We knew how um, we had other interventions, but that was the amount of disease that we saw. In 1958, there were 763,000 cases of measles with 552 deaths. Contrast that with 2006, 55 cases of measles, zero deaths. That's what the measles vaccine has done for the population. And you can go through this table here uh, showing all the different diseases that used to affect hundreds of thousands of people with hundreds of deaths have gone down to zero cases, or almost zero cases, and no deaths. When you look at this list, I've never seen diphtheria, I've never seen measles, I've never seen pertussis, I've never seen, well, I saw one case of polio that was important. Uh, my best friend in, had rubella when he was in Japan, but that doesn't count. Never seen a case of smallpox. One case of tetanus as a fellow 25 years ago in a, in a, in a, in a Cambodian lady, never in the primary series. And I had saw one case of mumps in a 45 year old male last year. And I see nothing but infectious diseases every day for the last 25 years. And I never see any of these diseases. They have virtually disappeared in large part thanks to vaccines. Hepatitis A vaccine, unfortunately, invasive pneumococcal disease vaccine. So if you look, the vaccines are estimated to have accounted for, since 1980, a 92% decline in diseases caused by vaccines and a 99% decrease in deaths. And in kids, I mean, the people who do pediatrics have never seen in a case now of invasive homophilus disease. 
Haemophilus influenza. It gets in the bloodstream of children, it causes meningitis, and they die fast, and if they survive, they're brain damaged, and it's a horrible illness. You can now go through your entire residency and never see a case of Haemophilus influenza B. It's wonderful how these diseases um, have disappeared, with the one exception that I get paid only when I see infection, so afterwards I will be standing with a sign outside that says we'll do infectious diseases for food, because this has really had an adverse effect on my positive income flow, and I'm kind of looking forward to having these diseases come back. <laughs> and you can see in the United States, I've never seen polio, I've never seen an iron lung, and like I said, I've never seen measles, and smallpox has been eradicated worldwide. The last case was in 1976. And we've been uh, uh, smallpox free, except for a lab in the Soviet Union and a lab in the United States where it's all kept in a jar somewhere, which I'm sure they're going to release at some point uh, in the future. <laughs> 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 they've looked, if you, go, uh, if you go and look at the security around the biological warfare parts of the old Soviet Union, your basic 7-Eleven has better security. <laughs> it's very scary when you see the rusty barbed wire and the drunken soldiers, and they don't protect their biologics, and they don't protect their nuclear weapons, and they've been sort of selling them on the side, and so you're always worried that something like uh, uh, polio, I'm sorry, like smallpox is, is going to come back. So, they have great benefit. They have allowed, they have allowed us all to live in a uh, large part, uh, far longer than we should. <laughs> and, but as long as there's been vaccines, there have been people who are against them. As soon as Jenner started vaccinating against smallpox, people were objecting to smallpox vaccinations. And, and so and it's been going on since. And I'm going to stick primarily to sort of what's gone on in the last 10 years in the arguments against vaccine. And unlike the anti-vaxxers, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, I feel that I am constrained to the truth. Um, I saw this way to tell the whole truth about the truth. That's what I got to do. And when you go on the web, as we'll see, you don't always see that the truth is something that people are particularly um, interested in. Yeah. Now, there's the philosophical, political viewpoint that institutions and government should not and cannot enforce their people to have vaccines. I'm not going to talk about that. Um, that's not a scientific question. That's a religious, philosophical, political question. I, of course, think everybody should be seatbelted in, wear a helmet, and get a vaccine before they go. And I think uh, that uh, anybody who drives in the left lane of the freeway with a turn signal on should be eligible for physician-assisted suicide. <laughs> Any sign of the papers, but I'm a hard case that way. But I'm going to talk about the scientific questions, which is safety and efficacy of the vaccines and the things that people say about the vaccines and whether or not they're true. And Vaccine fear is varied by culture, which I think is very interesting. The French are convinced that hepatitis B causes multiple sclerosis. So if you go to France, it's the hepatitis B vaccine that the French are worried about. And that's where they put all their energy in. The French don't care about the MMR. The French don't care about, um, uh, about mercury, um, both of which I think um, are bound up by good Bordeaux. But they do worry about hepatitis B causing multiple sclerosis. The Nigerians have a whole different problem. The Nigerian Islamic clerics decided that polio was a Western plot to spread HIV and to sterilize their population so that there would no longer be African Islamic Nigerians. It was a plot to kill them from AIDS and sterilize them. And what happened in Nigeria is that the northern part of the country, because of this fear that it was going to sterilize everybody, everybody couldn't use the polio vaccine. And they were just, we were so close to the world of eradicating polio, it was amazing. We like got right up to the edge and it was disappearing in virtually everywhere but a few scattered areas until this happened. And now polio has come back with vengeance and not only has it been in Nigeria, it's spread into adjacent, it's gone to India, it's gone to Pakistan, it's gone to Afghanistan. Polio has spread from Nigeria and what's even more annoying is that the best vaccine in the population um, for, um, for polio is the live vaccine. Now, a live vaccine has downsides. The live vaccine is live. It occasionally causes polio. But